Hey everyone, it's Jim from Vows and More, an online vintage tube store. And today in Tube Lab number 54, we're going to take a first look at the lovely Matsushita EL34. But first, caution everyone, electronics and tube amplifiers can have very high voltages present, which can be lethal. Exercise extreme caution when working around them. Always consult a professional technician when in doubt. For a long time, I've been looking for the very high demand Matsushita EL34s, and finally I found enough to make a quad and some pairs. This is an interesting tube because it appears Phillips had a partnership with Matsushita as early as 1952, and as a result, Phillips Mullard, Phillips owned Mullard and many other high quality tube manufacturers, shared the, the Muller technology with Matsushita. Some say these tubes are basically Japanese Mullards. Let's take a close look at them and then we'll look at my listening notes. Let's start at the bottom and work our way up. I apologize for the light. I like to film on naturally lit days, but we've started into the winter in the Pacific Northwest and uh, we ha I have a personal rule in the winter here, even though we never, almost never get snow. Let's see if we can get the light on that a little better. Black's really hard to get, even in high def. Um, even though we don't have much of a winter really, it gets, it gets dark and it gets rainy. It's a rainy season. So until the spring, um, if we get a nice day, my rule, if we get a nice, nice hour, my rule is to run out and play because the rain's coming right behind it. Anyways, um, Unlike the Mullard XF2, there's no center pin. It's really hard to get that on camera, isn't it? There's no center pin in the key. There's no hole in the key. Let's see if we can get it back on. There we go. So, let's work with that light a little bit better. There we go. So, there's a lot of rebrands. Uh, RCA, GE, you name it. Um, Phillips put their name on these tubes. And I think the reason for that is the, uh, the new old stock, new in the box, and NOS, NIB uh, tubes that I found are probably uh, late 70s, early 80s. And I think Matsushita was making the, uh, was still running their tube factory after many of the Western companies like Mullard and Sylvania and Phillips had closed down. So there were only a handful of really good quality EL34 manufacturers left. And Matsushita, of course, was right at the top. RFT would be another one. Uh, Svetlana would be another one. Um, so let's take a look at the plates. Like the Mullard, the plates have two narrow slits. In this case, we got two horizontal ribs as well. And take a look at the rivets. They're really quite lovely. There's three rivets aside, so six rivets in total. They're very delicately made. They're lovely, in fact. Compared to the way the Russians rivet out their EO-34s, these are beautiful. The Russians look like they were, you know, they had rivets that could attach sheet metal to a tank or something. In fact, maybe that's where the rivet machine came from. Now, can you see, there's also, there it is, you see the three tack welds as well. That's pretty unusual to have welds and rivets. It's like a sign of a well-made plate structure. And we'll talk a little bit about noise at the end when we review these tubes. Also look at the claws. Now this is the same way Muller does their claws on the upper mica. There'll be these little spacers or teeth or whatever you want to call them. And then there'll be a gap in which it runs straight. And then we have some more on the other side. Those, of course, help hold the tube securely in the glass envelope so it doesn't bounce around or vibrate. And, and that's a common way to do it. Uh, Tungso had big teeth like this as well, or big claws. And we've got two shields on the top, up at the top where the heater comes through. And we've got one large, let's see if I can get it on camera. There it is. See the large, heavy halo getter? And of course, that means a chrome dome. And another defining feature of the real Matsushitas is the mold line. So there's a single heavy, it's very heavy, mold line across. Now the reason why I'm pointing out all these details is any um, high value, high demand tube that's popular like the EL34 
and the Matsushita is right up there with the early Mullards, um, are prone to being faked. I know, it's shitty. It happens though. I rarely get caught out. Um, and partly because I normally don't buy tubes unless I can actually see a picture of them before I buy them. But um, a long time ago I actually got some... What did I get in? I think I got in some EO34s from one of my wholesalers. A, a good guy actually, who I bought a lot of tubes from. And I don't think he knew that they had been faked. And um, I, I can't remember what it was. Oh, I think it was a 6SN7. It was the... Um, I don't remember the Mullard number. Anyways, um, I, I didn't have a lot of experience with fakes. And luckily, um, who was it? Was it Tube Maze jumped in on the video? And uh, he pointed out right away the gettering, uh, or the getters. And saucer getters are a dead giveaway. A lot of fakes will use inexpensive Russian tubes. In fact, a lot of fake tubes, I think, come out of the um, former East Bloc countries in Russia just because they had access to so many inexpensive tubes and the temptation to make some serious money is just so great and i wouldn't be surprised if some guys were had access to the equipment on the weekend or something in the tube factory and they just came in and did their own custom silk screening anyways that i am making up uh, all kinds of unfounded accusations at this point so <laughs> beware though if you have got these prime identifiers, the narrow slits, the narrow rivets, the seam, you, the base like that, you very much likely have the real Matsushita. So it's, it's actually not that hard to, it's one of the easier EO34s to identify. The big question is, um, how did they sound? Let me grab the, my listening notes. Now, when I do listening tests, I like to do it as neutral as I can in a good quality amp. So I used the Wilsonton R8, and I used the Rogers Sylvania 6SN7 GTB, which is a really nice 6SN7. It's um, it's a musical tube. It's it's almost exactly the same tube as the U.S. assembled Sylvania, and I've been selling a lot of these tubes, um, and they're a little bit more affordable, thank goodness. And because I've got lots of inventory, that means I get good matches. I can, you know, I can match up as close uh, design, minor design variations. It just makes it a whole lot easier to send good tubes out to customers. And beside that, I've got the Sylvania 6SL7 WGT, which is a fantastic tube. It's a mil-spec tube. It's very low noise. It's, it's fairly neutral for a 6SL7, but it's a good choice in this case because I want to hear the Matsushitas. I don't want to hear the the uh, 6SL7s. I'm going to hear them, but I mean I want it to be as neutral as I can get. Bass was good. Nice tone and neutral. Mid-range was very good. Nice tone. The three C's. Clean, clear, and crisp. Treble, not surprisingly, was very good with the three C's. This is very common in tube gear. We expect uh, any quality tube to sound really good in the treble. They just excel at it. And the mid-range. This is where the tubes are often weak, is down in the base. And sometimes it's not the tube's fault. Sometimes it's the amp's fault. And um, But I, I'm reviewing on an amp that has good 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 bass response. In fact, it's a good, the, the Wilson Tenari, it's a really nice um, class AB amp and it's, it's a great amp for testing quads uh, because the bias is quick, it's easy, I can change out a quad and um, re-bias it in, oh heck, two minutes maybe, and then come back in 30 seconds and make the final little adjustment. One thing of note with this tube is noise microphonics is very low. And one of the reasons I think it's so low is that the Japanese were just really careful um, manufacturers. And as a result, we've got a really well-made tube. And I think, that's, I think that's one of the reasons why people like these so much. I think there's a couple of reasons. One is for a long time, they were more affordable than a Mullard XF2. Uh, and that's rapidly changing. There, are, I've seen prices for new old stock tubes more than uh, um, 
more than a mullard and I've seen I've seen the price go up really steadily so it was a thrill to be able to get enough in to start matching some tubes especially a new old stock new in the box it's getting so rare to find 50 60 70 year old uh, power tubes that are brand new in conclusion the detail was great and the presentation was very clean and neutral so it's not surprising we have good detail but I had a big question here. What will they sound like when they're thoroughly burned in? Now, I burned them in for, they're brand new, so they probably have been tested briefly in the factory to make sure they light up and conduct. Maybe they've been tested once or twice before I got them, because, uh, you know, they're, they're 50, 60 year old tubes. Um, but I only burned them in for four hours. It's, I, you know, Things are incredibly busy here. There's there's a limit to how much time I've got that I can run a set of tubes before I need to, you know, swap them out. So I put a half a day into testing them on Occupied an app doing that. And um, I suspect not all tubes benefit from burn-in. Uh, a lot of vintage tubes that are used, well, they'll just plug in and they'll rock and roll right away. No problem. Um, but with some tubes, particularly new tubes, and in particularly old new tubes, they do, uh, they do improve over time. And I'm thinking that the presentation of this tube was so neutral that I have a feeling it's going to come a little bit more alive. Let's put that away. Stop blocking the screen. Um, now you get to watch my hands. I, you know, my hands move when I get excited. Everybody knows this. I try to quiet them down and not move them around. Um, but I have a feeling that these lovely sounding tubes are going to sound even better with maybe 12, 24 hours of burn-in time. Everybody online talks about these things in a uh, very enthusiastic tone. So I wish I had, you know, uh, time in the system to have them in there for two or three days burning in with music on low. Um, I think you could burn them in without the music, but I think most people like to have some music playing. Basically, they're putting the tube in circuit and using it the way it would be used. Now, if you've got a tube that you think can benefit from a bit of burn-in, does that mean that you can't listen to it? No, of course not. In fact, it's probably a great idea to have a listen because there's a very good chance um, that you'll get to witness the subtle um, changes as the tube starts to age a little bit and hopefully improve. Okay, well, enough blabbing on and on about this stuff. A whole bunch of my favorite, another power tube, my favorite power tube came in. Let's just clear the decks here. And be careful with those things. They, in case you didn't figure it out, they are not cheap tubes. In fact, they're expensive tubes. They're not as expensive as a Mullard would be. But my goodness, um, they're expensive. They cost a small fortune to buy wholesale, and as a result, um, they're not cheap at retail. One of the, my favorite uh, power tubes, I have a bunch. Everybody knows that I'm in love with Svetlana, and here's the Svetlana um, 6550C. And this, of course, is just a little lower powered uh, version of the KT88 and the thing I love about these tubes so much is the mid-range KT88s are wonderful punchy tubes. They have good bass. The music just pops. They're really a rock and roll tube um, and, Or any music that needs that kind of um, You know wall of sound coming at you like a hurricane <laughs> as I like to say uh, but the the mid-range is really me. It's um it's just not warm. It's very, how would I say, it's very flat. Uh, now, flat is not necessarily bad, but, you know, sometimes you need a little bit of this, and a little bit of that, a little bit of spice in the, in the music presentation to liven things up. Not every recording is, you know, the most dynamic thing ever made. And that's where the, uh, these Svetlanas, um, where they come in, because of all of the KT88s and 6550s I've ever tried, and I've tried many of them, 
Um, these have by far the nicest mid-range and they keep a lot of the punch. They keep the nice base of the KT88. So it's really a nice crossover too. If, if I was into, um, if I was into jazz, but I like to cross over to some more dynamic music, this would be my tube. Um, if I was just into jazz, I'd probably be sitting around in an EL34, if that was the sort of amp I had. Um, in my case, I'm a single-ended guy. And in fact, we're going to talk uh, next week about the uh, Yuri Monoblock kit amp, which uh, has been finalized, I'm happy to say. And um, we'll have a nice presentation about that amp next week. Okay, if you stay till the end, I've got some discount codes to help you out. Remember, I've got flat rate shipping of $20 around the world. I can get to almost every place, but if you live on an island or in the middle of nowhere, um, if nobody knows where you, where you are, there's a chance I need a small surcharge. I keep the cost down, though. We're, shipping is never expensive. And if your order is $150 or more, after your discount, the shipping's on me, folks. Okay, stay safe, everyone. This is Jim from Bells and More signing off. Cheers, everyone.